Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to address my episode from the other day. Uh, we talked about why is Jazz dead and who killed it? What killed it? And a lot of that <clears throat> is coming from two places. One, it's commercial, broad appeal, and it was the, the most important music in the world in the 30s and the 40s. It sold tens of millions of records, 78s. <clears throat> it had a huge commercial power. And that power that comes with that broad appeal makes the second aspect, its ability to enact change, much more tenable. Uh, for all the comments I got, and these are mostly on the Facebook groups, boy, there are some people acting just uh, in position, like, don't you know there's jazz in London right now? <clears throat> yeah, I know that. Don't you know there's jazz? Yeah, I know there's jazz in New York. I've been to many jazz clubs. It's you, me, and 17 other people. It's not a powerful thing. It's a minimal thing that has zero audience. And it has zero capacity to affect change. That's why it's dead. Figure it out. It's not about, oh, there's nobody in the world playing jazz anymore. That's ridiculous. And I'd have to live in a cave to not know people are still playing jazz. I know people still play jazz. I know people still write jazz. I know jazz still has classes and school schoolings being taught. Of course jazz is still an art form that's well respected. But in terms of its ability to impact the world and make changes like it did, you have to be living in a cave to think that that's the, the case. When it lost its audience, it lost its power. It lost its life force. And that's where I'm coming from. Jazz of a certain era was so charged with social value, political, economic currency. This music brought Americans together of different races who have been divided for centuries. <clears throat> you know, we think of sports being this great coming together of black and white. But what the inroads that sports makes into white Americans accepting blacks was all paved for by what jazz accomplished and did in the first half of the 20th century. And that means that even the, mo the majority of the jazz that we love comes at the very tail end of this movement. And as jazz is diminishing and losing its entire power source, its, its platform, its megaphone, soul, R&B, and then eventually hip-hop picks that megaphone up and continues that black message of we must be free. At any cost, we will find our freedom. And anything beyond that now is just cats playing notes. And they might be just fine. And I've heard some of it, and a lot of them are great players. It has no power. It has no social impact. And that's what I define it being alive as. And other forms of art and music have had that same power. But once it goes into disuse, its ability to affect change disappears. Thus, it's rendered powerless and dead. And so you can be nostalgic and try to reignite and live in the past and talk about how we can still make, yeah, you can still make jazz. You can still make Summer of Love classic rock records. That doesn't mean those records are going to create a hippie movement. You're not going to have the counterculture go and start trying LSD because you made a record in 2020 about the summer of love. And I'll, I've said it this way before, and I'm going to say it again. It's a bit like this, the language of Latin. Latin is a language that's no longer spoken. It's no longer in use. It no longer has its power. People still speak it today. Some things are even still written in Latin. It still has a highly esteemed school of art and education around it. And so it's not like it's anything to be ridiculed, but Latin today is not going to change the world. You could write all the rules and bylaws you want in Latin. Ain't no one going to understand any of that. Ain't no one going to follow any of that. Latin is a, a moment that's passed us by. And just because there's people who can still read it and write it and 
just because it's got a small percentage of use still in society today, it's so marginalized that anything it did have to say would have zero ripple effect. Zero. And all the jazz in London today isn't going to make an inch of change. It's just, it's just not. It's, it's, it's such a small, and no matter how immersed you are in it, and no matter how big you think that scene is, if 99 out of 100 people can't mention a single name in the country that this is happening in, it has no value, it has no power. That's the whole point. And that's what I define it as being alive or dead. So I'm not saying there's not practitioners out there who are doing fine things, but boy, a lot of that message, even in the, in the commercialized era of jazz in the 70s and 80s, had zero power. Zero. It didn't have any social impact. It didn't stand for or liberate or free anyone. But the music of Armstrong liberated a people. It humanized the people. It brought two different groups who had never really been together into the same room. It opened us up to sexual relations, spiritual interconnection. It changed the face of the, of the fabric of this entire country. That's a powerful thing. And to be honest, Bebop loses the audience and the power diminishes with that. And even a lot of the most powerful records in the, in the Blue Note canon suffer from the fact that the music was already being marginalized dramatically. And Blue Note in its heyday doesn't have close to the power of what Armstrong had, what he was wielding in his hands, in that mouth of his. Armstrong's one of the most powerful figures in American history, and jazz had an incredibly powerful energy source for a long time to effect change. And once that broad appeal that allows many people to hear it its message no longer has transpondence and hip hop had that for a while, punk rock carried that for a while, even heavy metal had some conscious moments, Rage Against the Machine there's moments where art can really transcend <clears throat> uh, it's again so it's not saying that there's not jazz out there today being made, of course there is it's a highly respected art form that many people are doing fine impressions of. I don't think they're really stretching the fabric anymore in the present. It's pretty much just rehashing what's already been done. There's not much you can do with a trumpet or a saxophone that these great men hadn't already done. But none of what they did was for the sake of ego or to show how great I am. It was about freedom. It was about human humanizing myself making you see my ability making you see my humanity i drank the old coffee cup not the most pleasant thing in the world i'd rather have my fresher warmer coffee thank you very much and so all you people on facebook who get so offended and my favorites are the ones who are like i'm not even gonna watch this but it's just a bunch of non go fuck yourself man if you ain't gonna watch it don't comment who the fuck are you to make an egotistical comment on something you didn't even bother to watch. Most of that episode was about praising Louis Jordan and showing how the power of jazz transitions into that R&B soul movement. That, the power didn't die. It just moved into a different vehicle and powered itself through the 50s and 60s into the 70s and then it transitions again into the voice of hip hop. The message of the black people will always be there as long as they're an oppressed people and there's a harmony and a, a, a simpatico between what Marvin Gaye says and what John Coltrane says and what Chuck D says it's the same thing let my people go just like you can't add to the biblical canon today you could write about it you can be inspired by it but you can't add to that canon at this point that is a finite place and time that were an oppressed people wrote great words of freedom and liberty and justice and morality and it was the oppression of those people for centuries if not millennia that allowed them to tell the rest of us what justice and freedom and honesty and truth should even look like 
So again, to those of you who think, oh, Jazz ain't dead, it's dead. It has no power and it's not going to come back. Trust me, it's not going to ever be that powerful force that it was. And in and, and some ways, it's, it, that's a good thing because it means that we've moved further along than where we were in 1925. Uh, we still got a ways to go. You know, we still got a lot of chinks in our armor. But people get so worked up. You know, I'm not slagging anybody who's playing the music today. That's ridiculous. But <clears throat> people, you know, and their egos and their their sense of it, oh, I know so much and you're ridiculous. I'm not even going to watch you tonight. I'm going to say you're ridiculous. I don't even why know I, I get bothered by that, but it's just... Watch it before you comment. But anyway, that being said, there's a lot of great guys out there who still play the music, and I've seen a lot of them live. Didn't remember most of their names. Uh, it just doesn't have that soul gut stirring feeling that I get from Marvin Gaye. What's going on? That I get get from Coltrane's Love Supreme. That I get from Sam Cooke. A change is gonna come. That stuff makes my guts stir. I feel the power in it. And if you don't see what I'm talking about, maybe you need to awaken yourself socially to the aspects of what drives great art in the first place. Oppression and tyranny is the fuel that invents and drives great art. And I think there's little exception to that. And art is capable of being made by people who aren't oppressed. But even a lot of those people end up having a, a form of madness, uh, some form of struggle that really art is an outlet for what they can't struggle through the condition of on their own. Art helps them survive. It helps express what they can't say. I'm gonna move on. One of the great examples to me of the embers of the jazz movement. And one of the guys who really, I think, is filled with soul and guts and spirit and speaking for the black community and is an extension of Armstrong, Hawkins, and Webster and is filled with that love, that love of self, that love of my people, that love of all people. And my intention is to bring us together <clears throat> not to divide us. But I do want to inform you of my good intentions, of my positivity, of my love. Because I'm hoping once I show you my love for my fellow man, black and white, that you will have more empathy for me and my group. And of course I'm talking about the great Gene Ammons. And <clears throat> for value for your dollar. Ammons is one of your best bangs for the buck. Uh, Prestige documents a great chunk of his body of work. He does some earlier stuff on VJ with Benny Green and a few other people. And that album has two different covers, so be careful. Uh, and that's a fine session, Benny Green cooks. And Ammons does some stuff with Stitt over the years. They kind of had these battling things. And a lot of that stuff ended up on the Argo Chess label. And there was even some dispute on uh, where a few things were going to go. I'm not going to show you his Argo stuff. I'm not going to show you his VJ stuff. I'm going to show you his body of work at Prestige. And, <clears throat> boy, you can get Gene Ammons records for under $100, original pressings, that are incredible records. Drenched with the blues. Drenched with expression. Drenched with sincerity. Never an inkling of ego, never even a suspicion of virtuosity for the sake of look at me. It's always with Gene Ammons, an expression of my discontent and a, a way of finding and turning that around to try to make things better for me and my people. <clears throat> He's a beautiful man. He's a beautiful spirit and it exudes through so much of his playing. And he quite quietly has some of the best lineups in the history of the prestige label on these records. 
And I'm going to show you that to illustrate just how great Gene Ammons was. <clears throat> He's the son of a great stride piano player. And his jazz lineage is royalty. He's really a much more highly esteemed name in the jazz community than he is today in the jazz collector community. Uh, his, a lot of his records get alternate covers from Prestige, so you gotta be careful with that because you'll end up coming home with the same record with two different covers. Uh, most of them will have the same number, so if you get to know your Prestige catalog, you'll be a little safer because you'll know 7039, I do have that. And that's part of why I started doing my catalogs and bringing them with me when I went shopping so I could know what labels uh, do I have this record already? What label do I not have? This? And with Blue Note, it's simple. There's no reissues. There's no different covers. There's no repackaging. It's always just another record, another record, another record, another record. But almost all the other labels are really tricky with what they're putting out and when they're putting it out. A lot of deception going on. But anyway, we're going to jump in. 7039. So 1955-56. I'm guessing this was recorded probably in 55. I'm not sure doesn't say but it's Gene Ammons with the great Art Farmer Art Farmer for those who aren't familiar is a wonderful mid-range trumpet player on the softer side of the of the trumpet camp more with the Chet Bakers and the Miles Davises if you like any of those guys you'll love Art Farmer uh, the great Jackie McLean who's generally considered an avant-garde guy by most people in the 50s he was still cutting his teeth he came from the bebop school and he plays the blues here with these guys like a champion. Uh, Candido plays some percussion on this. The great pianist from the bebop era, Duke Jordan, is killing it. Addison Farmer is Art Farmer's brother, and I believe he plays the bass. And Art Taylor, the great drummer, who plays on infinite great sessions, rounds out this group. And this group kind of stays uh, around for a couple years, and then it starts making some dramatic changes as we go forward. The next record I want to show you is 7050, and this has an alternate cover as well. This is actually the second cover, but it's an older pressing than the OJC of the original cover that I have. So I just, I'm just i showing you this one, 7050. Uh, this is Gene Ammon's Battle Sonny Stitt. And some of this stuff goes back to 5152, where Duke Jordan, Tommy Potter, and Joe Jones was with Sonny Stitt and Gene Ammons leading the way. Uh, 1950 with... Gene Wright, Junior Manson, Wesley Landers, um, Bill Massey, Al Oatcult, Charlie Bateman, Gene Wright, and Teddy Stewart. And then some of it is also, there's a few tracks that are just the, the regular sextet. And actually Lou Donaldson shows up on alto, along with Freddie Red and Kenny Clark with Edison Farmer, Gene Ammons, and uh, Art Farmer. So some great stuff on this one as well. I'm trying to remember what label this is on the middle. I haven't listened to this one in a while. It's still got the record inside of it. And that's the blue Trident label. So probably a 1960s pressing of that. And again, it's just... Stitt and Ammons together are fantastic. In part because Stitt is a bit more of... <clears throat> uh, I wouldn't say ego-driven, but he's a bit more of a improviser in the sense of virtuosity. And Ammons is all feel and gut. And when you put them together, that creates an interesting cross breeze. Uh, this is a fantastic session, 7060. So you see 7039, 7050, 7060. There's three records that come out fairly quickly here, fairly early in the 7000 sequence. And so many people ignore Gene Ammons, and it's, it's a mistake. And again, you can get these records so much cheaper than most of what's contemporary with these records on the Prestige label. This is an OJC copy of this. I also have an older version with uh, the second cover. This is actually, I believe, the first cover here on this OJC. This has Donald Byrne added to it instead of uh, Jackie McLean. Our farmer's still on it, too. Watkins, Taylor, and Waldron. And is this all from one session? Looks like it is. <clears throat> fantastic Gene Ammons right there. Uh, these early records are really charged powerful. This is the funky record and another fantastic album cover. I'm going to throw a little bit of this one on. You definitely want to kind of start with 
the early Ammons 7000 records. They're really fantastic pieces of work. And there's some blues. And if you don't love Gene Ammons playing the blues, <clears throat> You know, I mean, go listen to some plastic music because this has got a lot of guts to it. Uh, the great Kenny Burrell is added to this one here, along with McLean, Taylor, Waldron, Art Farmer, and then Doug Watkins takes Addison Farmer's place on this session. Uh, looks like it's all from one recording session, probably 1956, 57, no, probably 56. <clears throat> uh, just beautiful tone. And he comes from the Hawkins Webster Illinois Jockhead School. You know, he's in that lineage. Uh, Stanley Turrentine is kind of a, a progenitor after him of the same blues driven, soul drenched. Uh, this has a bit of a smoky alleyway to it uh, with a misty rain and black and, black and white noir. Uh, there's a fire escape. There's a maiden screaming off of the distance and a cat shrieking. It's just got that beautiful element of moodiness to it that I'm a huge fan of in my jazz. Uh, this is a fun record. Idris Suleiman sits in on this one, along with Kenny Burrell, Art Taylor, Paul Chambers, Mal Waldron, and Jackie McLean. So the lineup's changing slowly here. Uh, Art Taylor's still around. Jackie's still around. Kenny Burrell sticks around. But of course, the trumpet player and Mal Walder has changed, and the bass player has changed again to Paul Chambers. Uh, another cool cover. Cool artwork. I think it's all from one session as well. You can see some photos of these young men down here on the bottom. It was just such a dangerous time. The 1950s, the early 60s, to be a black male, it was a dangerous thing. And a lot of these young black men were being exposed to two things in the ghetto. There was a lot of heroin going around, meant to subvert the black neighborhoods, and to make either junkies or criminals out of a large chunk of them. So you could keep subverting them as civil rights was dawning. But there was also a, la a large, strong Muslim movement. And a lot of jazz cats who were trying to stay clean, were trying to stay away from the pathway of sin, felt the message of Allah and the Muslim faith as a way to keep their purity and their clean, their cleanliness. Uh, it's amazing how many of them kind of do convert at one time or another to our Blakey, of course, uh, is, is another great example, uh, Yusef Latif. There's a lot of guys that really said, uh, I feel like I can be stronger in my faith and in myself and survive the dangers of this if I adhere to some of that tradition. And it certainly was, it seemed successful for a lot of them. And I don't think the stigma of being Muslim in those days is quite what it is today. Uh, that certainly changed nowadays. Here's another great session. Again, sadly, it's really overlooked. We're talking 7132 which should put it probably 1957. And it's a second pressing Trident label. This is the big sound. And who's on the big sound? Oh, nobody of note. Just John Coltrane, just, just Pepper Adams and Jerome Richardson, Paul Kinnishe. It's, uh, again, when you say Gene Ammons All-Stars, George Joyner, R. Taylor, and Mel Waldron round up the rhythm section. Simple cover, not a lot to the album to show you, but boy, Coltrane here, of course, was now in the prestige fold. And so he shows up fairly frequently as a sideman at prestige in 57. Like it's really that year. He kind of comes to the fold in 56, 57, his first record comes out. He's been, him and Miles have been signed to Columbia with the Miles group. And so he's also doing that stuff with Miles, but Miles' work was fairly sporadic already. So it left him a lot of time. And Miles, Coltrane was dealing with junk. He was dealing with the changes. He was rehearsing nonstop. 
And I think he looked at every chance to record as an opportunity to develop himself. And he really puts himself out there on a lot of recordings. This is Blue Gene 7146. And another fantastic session. Gene Ammons, Idris Suleiman, Pepper Adams, Mal Waldron, Doug Watkins, and Ray Barreto. And Barreto and the Conga gives it a bit of a Latin feel, which was kind of, of course, uh, kind of a bit of the rage there for a while. <clears throat> Gene Ammons, Boss Tenor. Another great record, another beautiful old pressing. I found this in Rockford, Illinois. And Rockford's a great little town because it's on the perimeters of Chicago, you know, about an hour west of Chicago. A lot of blacks moved to Rockford. Uh, that means a lot of black records were in Rockford. But it doesn't have the high rents that Chicago or a place like New York has. So those record stores don't need to mark their stuff out quite as high. So those midtown, those mid-sized towns that have black populations in the 50s and 60s are sometimes the best place to find jazz records in the wild for a good price. Uh, if you go to a city that didn't have a black population any further west really than Rockford or Milwaukee, it becomes pretty tough. And the records just don't exist even here in Minneapolis. You know, there's probably more old jazz and R&B records in 45s in a small town like Rockford than there is in the Twin Cities. You know, old Prestige, old Blue Note, they're just not to be found in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, but you go to a place like Rockford, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, those type of towns, you'll be surprised with Dayton, Ohio. You can find some great stuff there. Uh, again, just a fantastic lineup. This has got Tommy Flanagan on the piano. And Flanagan, for a guy who didn't do a lot as a leader, certainly does a lot as a sideman, just a prolific sideman. And he's one of those guys that his body of work as a leader is small, like a Paul Chambers, but his list of work as a sideman is pages long. And sometimes these guys will later in life make more records as a leader. I know Tommy Flanagan did. Uh, as, as for uh, Chambers, he passes away and he spends most of the 60s working with uh, Wynton Kelly. And so there's not a lot of Paul Chambers led sessions but he's on hundreds of records in the 50s and 60s as a sideman. Uh, again, great cover, great color, intonation. And this is just the blues. And the blues is meant to soothe you. Tell him, Gene. That's the essence of it right there. If you feel it in your gut, you feel that in your gut, it just... You know what they're dealing with on a day-to-day. -day. You know, the things that are happening, Rosa Parks sitting on the bus, the civil rights movements in the South and the big cities and the riots. All this is starting to create a real terrifying tension. And if that's not going to soothe and calm you as a player and as a listener, I don't know how to help you. That's what this music is. It's help. It's aid. And it's aiding me, and I hope as a person who's playing it, and I'm talking from Gene Ammon's perspective, it's helping me, and I'm hoping that it's also helping you, the listener. And it's also important to remember that this is validating black interests to many young white listeners. And that continues to happen in R&B. Like I said in that last episode, that power of trying to find unity and express my condition, it moves into the soul singers with vocals that civil rights allows to happen. These guys couldn't necessarily pick up a microphone and say the things Curtis Mayfield and Marvin Gaye said in the 70s. But in the 60s, it starts to happen. In the 50s, you gotta say it into a saxophone. But if you don't think the message is the same, why would a black man in the 50s who had tougher times not tell you how he really feels. I think you have to ignore history to not hear what I'm saying. Another fantastic Ammons record. Gene Ammons Jug, 7192. Uh, another fantastic lineup on this one. 
Richard Am Gene Amansari, Richard Wyans, Clarence Sleepy Anderson, uh, Doug Watkins, and Ray Barreto. It's kind of a smaller quintet by the sounds of it. One, two, three, yeah. And it's a small quintet when you have the conga being one of your members. It's really a quartet with a conga player. Uh, but that conga adds a nice light, effervescent sprightliness. It makes it bouncy and have little off-tempo, off-kilter rhythms that bring life and joy into the song. Uh, and then there's, there's Mr. Hammonds. Just look at the face. And it's not the face of an angry young man. It's more the hopefulness that what I'm going to do and what I've done and what I'm going to continue to do will make lives better for my descendants. And that's an important thing to a people who live in occupation, to people who live under tyranny. You want to continue making things better. And I think a lot of us forget that. This is another great record, 7201, Gene Ammons and his All-Stars. And uh, by 7201, we're probably 1959, 60, I'm thinking. Doesn't list the date here, which they often don't do. Uh, again, listen to the lineup on this one. John Coltrane, Jerome Richardson, Pepper Adams, Paul Kinoche, Mal Waldron, George Joyner, and Arthur Taylor. That's pretty serious jazz royalty. And so many collectors today just seem to pass over Gene Ammons. And I'm a little bit mystified by it. You can get an old prestige copy of these records for what's really a steal. We're going to kind of skip through some of these later ones. 7208, Gene Ammons uptight. Walter Bishop, Patty Brown, George Duvivier. Arthur Taylor, Arthur Davis on the bass, and Ray Barreto again on the conga. So Barreto's playing with him quite a lot at this point. Gorgeous. Sonny Stitt and Gene Ammons. This is called the Soul Summit. Soul, Soul Summit. And I think this is from 1962. So again, Ammons and Stitt work off, work off and on together from the early 50s into the late 60s. They're doing these great sessions together. Uh, this is Gene Adams' Twist in the Jug with the great trumpet player Joe Newman who played with Basie and is a really beautiful mid-range trumpet player that a lot of people don't know much about. The great Jack McDuff is on the organ and that's gonna bring a certain element of soul jazz to this. And then the bossa nova thing in 62 is so powerful that even guys like Ammons on Prestige where they're like, can you make us a bossa record? And a guy like Ammons can put the blues on top of anything. And I think so many people think the blues has to just be 12 bars and a certain repetitions. Not the case. A great blues player can inflect the blues on top of anything. And if you want to hear what the bossa nova sounds like, with a lot of bluesy inflection. Gene Am and this record is not that hard, tough to find. It sold pretty well. And that was part of what the Bossa Nova thing was about, is they're always gonna sell well. And so it makes them pretty easy to come by. Willis Jackson does one as well from the same era on Prestige. And that record's pretty easy to come by. This is Preaching, Gene Ammons, 7270. So we're probably in the 63, maybe 64 now. Uh, this is with Gene Ammons, tenor sax, with organ, bass, and drum accompaniment. That's what it says. Never seen that before in all my days. Why well, doesn't list the band here? I don't know. I'll have to look that up sometime. I've never noticed that before. It just says, with organ, bass, and drum accompaniment. Lots of information there, guys. Thanks. Again, we're going to kind of skip through here. This is with Etta Jones and Jack McDuff. Great soul, vocal, barbecue blues. Uh, this is late hour special. And by this time, the artwork at Prestige to me, it's not good. And Prestige's artwork was always kind of an up and down affair without any question in my mind. Velvet Soul. And again, these records are gonna tend to be more uh, crossover. 
elements of R&B at this point. Uh, Frank West is on this. Johnny Hammond Smith, the great organ player. Doug Watkins and Art Taylor. Mal Waldron's on a couple of the tracks. And then there's even a bigger group with Oliver Nelson, Clark Terry, Red Holloway. Quite a big ensemble on a couple of the tracks. Uh, this is Angel Eyes 7369, which is probably 1965. Indeed it is. Again, Waldron, Smith, Frank West, Wendell Marshall, Art Taylor, Ed Thigpen, so a big group. This is Gene Ammon's brother, Jug. Pretty late record there, 77, 92, which is probably 69. Uh, this is a great record, nice and cool. Moodsville Prestige. And if you don't love the Prestige Moodsville stuff, you should check it out, it's fantastic. And then this comes out later. Uh, it's probably from 1970, 71, 71. And uh, it's the great Dexter Gordon and Gene Ammons playing together. I think it's at a hotel somewhere. North Park Hotel in Chicago in 1970. And that's two giants of this music. Playing the blues. Trying to heal a great wound. And Ammons to me represents one of the great players of the late era towards the ends of the jazz age that really carries the love and forgiveness and understanding and compassion of Louis Armstrong into the 70s. And if you don't agree with me that jazz lost its power and or if you just wanted to find it your own way, that's fine. You know, do I recognize there's still great people out there playing? Of course. There's still great people out there playing classic rock. There's still great people out there playing any, any form of music you can think of, no matter how past it is, there's someone out there still doing it. It doesn't mean it's still an alive, powerful source of energy. And the amount of change that jazz created and the amount of healing that jazz brings makes jazz during that period one of the most powerful and most beautiful art forms in the history of the world. And no matter how great a player is today, they're not connected to that electricity. And it's just impossible. It's just not in the works. And I'll be honest, I don't really know where in music today that power lies. Because most of the music coming out of the black community today even has been stripped of any of that message. It's become very commercial, very about uh, selling products to consume, wristwatches and cars and uh, stuff that Marvin Gaye would just be like, what? what are you talking about? Why are you trying to convince young black kids they need Lamborghinis? You know, why do they, why do these guys, kids have diamonds in their, on their teeth and in their ears and diamonds, like, why are they wasting their time and their money on these things? Especially to make people outside of your community wealthy and to keep you either in debt or a criminal in order to get these things that cost tens of thousands of dollars. It's, it's just, it makes no sense. It's almost a new form of oppression and economic debt is a form of oppression. You know, freedom is not being in debt. Freedom is having the liberty to make the choices you want to make. And it's not to say that uh, the slavery of economic debt is the same as the slavery of what the blacks experienced in America, you know, for 300 years. But it's there's still a great new form of slavery out there that's got most people's life chosen path for them. So anyway, Gene Ammons is outstanding. You can get his records for a great price. It's always a record worth picking up when you see his stuff. Don't hesitate. Uh, it's, it's some of the shining work of the Prestige label from 55 all the way through 1970. And if you had to compare him to someone at Blue Note, it'd probably be Stanley Turrentine. You know, he's probably in that same uh, blues, jazz, soul jazz, uh, pre-war swing player small group jazz. There's a lot of stuff by Hawkins and Ben Webster that comes out in the 50s on Verve that doesn't sound too different. Even Hawkins makes Bossa Nova records at Impulse. 
you know. So Ammons is definitely a giant that is kind of overlooked a little too much. Check him out. You want to spend big bucks on them. A lot of them have OJC reissues, especially the early ones. And those ones that get into the 7200s, 7300s, those records are out there for 10, 20 bucks. They're everywhere because they sold well. And that's, again, one of the last things I want to touch on is that Hard Bop sort of had moments where it sold okay. <clears throat> it had moments where it got into jukeboxes, some of those Blue Note tracks. And it certainly had a black audience, again, uh, if ever so briefly. But then the soul jazz movement of the 60s into the 70s, that actually had a fairly decent audience. And a lot of that stuff sold well. A lot of that stuff has a lot of 45 issues for jukeboxes and singles and the radio. So a lot of that soul jazz is kind of the last embers of jazz that actually carried with it that social change and that power. And once we get into the later eras and that, I'm not sure I've really heard a jazz record that has that capacity anymore. And even if it did, the audience wouldn't understand it anymore because it's now being spoken vocally by singers and rappers. So those listening to jazz aren't hearing the message because they don't know how to, how to hear it anymore. And I'll even go so far as to say, most listeners today don't know how to hear jazz. They're listening, and they're not feeling. They're listening for incredible virtuosity, incredible arrangements. Listen to how brilliant the composition is. And it's just against everything that jazz initially was about. It was about emoting and improvising, so you could feel something, so I could connect with you. And that's what modern music and jazz even just lacks. And that's why a lot of modern listeners don't know how to hear jazz because they don't know how to feel what an artist is saying, especially if there's not words telling them what to feel. It's a bit like when we used to watch silent pictures. We had to kind of deduce and feel our way through what the, 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 the message was supposed to be. But once the words were spoken our interpretations of that diminish because now it's a finite thing through what words are saying. And once we became trained to hear what words were saying, it became a lot tougher for the audience to feel what jazz was saying. And if that's not proof that this music is dead, again, it's just a definition. It's not an insult. I'm not putting down any of that modern jazz. It's just, it comes from a different place. It doesn't have the same power in forming it, nor the same audience perceiving it. So its impact is minimal. And so I want people to be clear on what I mean when I say that. And there's no need to be all offended. I'm not insulting any of those modern players in any way. In fact, I'm friends with some of them. I chat with them on, on the jazz groups. I chat with them even here on, on this channel. It's not diminishing their talent or abilities and they do a great service to classic jazz by playing this music and this art form so peace be with you y'all have a great day and i challenge you all to not listen but to close your eyes and feel what a guy like gene ammons is saying to you feel what louis armstrong is saying to you all the great cats from those Basie bands that made lots of records in the 50s and 60s as leaders. Feel what those guys are saying to you. It's impactful. And it's where the power and the magic lies unilaterally. And there's a lot of great music that's still being made. But it doesn't have that source. Y'all be safe. We'll talk to y'all soon. Of course, comments and feedback. I appreciate it all. I haven't been able to get to as many comments lately and, and respond. Things have been kind of crazy, holidays and all that. But uh, I'm going to try to get to some stuff in the last few videos and comment to some stuff today. And like I said, that video I did the other day, man, it got a lot of comments on YouTube, on, fa on Facebook. A lot of the Facebook groups were just livid 
and some people loved what I had to say and loved the continuation of the black music and the understanding of how it went through Louis Jordan and Ray Charles and all those cats. And other people were just like indignant, like, oh, oh. And then there was, of course, the few who didn't even watch it and were indignant. Watch something else. Peace.